right, this is about chapter three, Intervals and Transposition and the Dancing Cat. So, an interval, of course, is the distance or the relationship in pitch between two tones. Um, the cat, Muffy the cat, is playing tone clusters, which is a very modern thing to do and uh, is a heavy feature in certain 20th century music. And you can read all the chapters here, important, con I mean, the paragraphs here about, well, you wanna be able to hear intervals and identify intervals, uh, which you'll be working on oral skills, and this is the visual part of seeing intervals. So, a line repeated, that's a prime. A line to the very next space is a second. It could be a space to a line. A line to a line or a space to a space is a third. Then once you start skipping lines and spaces, you got a fourth. Notice that seconds and fourths and sixths are line to space or space to line. Fifths, line to line, like thirds and primes or space to space. Sixth, seventh, octave. You get eight different pitches in inside of an octave. And a repeated note is a unison. Primes, fourths, fifths, and octaves are perfect. They don't have a minor version. So you don't do major or minor. They're perfect. They can, all intervals can be augmented or diminished. Major intervals can have minors. Perfect is just diminished, perfect, augmented. Um, so you can read that and ponder it. The standard abbreviation is capital M for major and lowercase m for minor, P for perfect. There's no half steps in a perfect prime. There's one half step in a minor second there's two half steps in a major second. There's one and a half steps in a major third and two whole steps in a perfect major, minor, sorry. One and a half steps in a minor third, two whole steps in major third. And then an example would be seven to eight of a major scale is an example of, of a minor second, T-do. Do-re is an example of a major second. Um, do me is an example of a minor third. Do me is an example of a major third. Do fa is an example of a perfect fourth and it has five half steps. A perfect fifth has seven half steps and do so is in a major or minor scale is a good example of that. Do le is one to six in a minor scale, harmonic minor scale, has eight half steps. Do la has nine half steps, one to six in a major scale. Do te, one to seven in a natural minor scale, has 10 half steps, that's a minor seventh. 11 half steps, one to seven in a major scale, do to t is a major seventh, and 12 half steps is a perfect octave. Consonants and dissonants are words. So the consonant intervals that have a lot of stability don't generally require being resolved are perfect primes, minor and major thirds, perfect fifths, minor and major sixths, and perfect octaves. And all other intervals, seconds and fourths and sevenths, are considered to be dissonant and unstable and requiring resolution. So a second makes you want to feel a fourth likes to resolve to a third, a seventh likes to resolve to an octave. Then, if you take a minor interval and adjust one of the notes to make it a half step smaller, you got a diminished interval. So, for example, F to A. F to A is a major third. F to A sharp is an augmented third. F to A flat is a minor third. 
f to a double flat is a diminished third. Another example, f to c is a perfect fifth. f to c sharp is an augmented fifth. f to c flat is a diminished fifth. Intervals can sound the same and look the same on a piano keyboard, but be spelled differently on the staff. C to A flat is a minor sixth. B sharp to G sharp is a minor sixth. It's the exact same pitching sound. Excuse me, a pitch sound on the keyboard, but it's spelled differently. And then you could also spell it as an augmented fifth. So if you're being required to spell a particular interval on a staff, you have to be careful that you actually spell that interval on a staff. Otherwise, I have to count it wrong. So if you make a minor six look like an augmented fifth, um, it's not the same thing. It just looks like the same thing. So here, example, this is a major third. That's correct. To write it as E to A flat is incorrect. That is a diminished fourth. A perfect fifth would have to be spelled like this. If you go B to F to B sharp, that's wrong. That's an augmented fourth. Um, the most common enharmonic intervals are augmented fourths and diminished fifths, and they're both called tritones um, because they have three whole steps in them. Now, the tricky part, I think, is when you get to inversion of intervals by turning intervals upside down. And here on page 60 is a chart that just reminds you, perfect stays perfect, major becomes minor, minor becomes major, diminished intervals become augmented, augmented intervals become diminished, unisons turn into octaves, seconds turn into sevenths, they always add up to nine, thirds turn into sixths, Fourths turn into fifths, fifths turn into fourths, sixths turn into thirds, and seventh turn into seconds, and octaves turn into unisons. So here's figure 3.16. When you invert F to D and make it D to F, you take a major sixth and it becomes a minor sixth. A perfect fifth becomes a perfect fourth. A diminished seventh becomes an augmented second. A major third becomes a minor sixth. A diminished fifth becomes an augmented fourth. So just think about that a little bit because you'll be glad you did. Then we have compound intervals. That's where you get more than an octave. So like an octave plus a second is a major ninth. An octave plus a third is a major tenth. A perfect fourth plus an octave is a perfect eleventh. A perfect fifth plus an octave is a perfect twelfth. Nobody does this. A perfect, um, a major six plus an octave is a major thirteenth. A major seventh plus an octave is a major fourteenth. A major octave plus an octave is a perfect fifteenth. And um, a lot of times when you have compound intervals, you just label them as their simpler equivalents. It's only necessary if for some reason you have to stress their actual size. So history, not all intervals are exactly the same size today as they were in earlier times. In fact, um, there were various tuning systems or what I like to call tuning recipes throughout the centuries that dictated specific distances between interval pitches. So we have something called equal temperament and that's been accepted as the standard for nearly all music written in the Western world. But there were um, a variety of tuning methods that came before equal temperament, and they're still in use throughout the world and also on historical instruments. Pythagorean tuning. During the 6th century, the philosopher Pythagoras worked out this Pythagorean tuning. Um, it only uses pure fifths found in the harmonic series, the overtone series. The Pythagorean system would appear to be ideal because of the purity of the fifths, but other intervals, particularly seconds and thirds, are compromised when your fifths are perfect. Major seconds and thirds in Pythagorean tuning are larger than our, our equal temperament um, intervals, and the minor seconds and thirds are smaller. 
Just intonation, which was popular in the 1400s, solved the problem of outer tune major to chords by tuning a few major thirds according to the harmonic series. And the results were that some of the major thirds, well, most of the major, major most of the thirds and some of the fifths were pure, but the remaining fifths were smaller. A lot of times what happened is that certain keys sounded really good and other keys not so much. Unequal temperaments um, became popular around 1650, and these gave up the pure thirds and the pure fifths and kind of distributed the error or difference over enough intervals that most chords sounded okay. Um, the best known of these unequal temperaments was um, it were those of Andreas Werkmeister, and he wrote a treatise called Musicologist Temperature in 1691. Um, gave a number of unequal temperaments that are still in use today in pipe organs. If you've got a pipe organ that's a either a historical organ <coughs> or a replicable historical organ, you are likely to want to tune it in the tuning system of the time period that it features or it's referenced. Um, certain pieces in Bach's well-tempered clavier are composed for an instrument tuned to one of the unequal temperaments as opposed to equal temperament. So a lot of times people, if they're really trying to be a purist, they'll do the research to find out what sort of temperament Bach was using at the time that he was composing a particular piece. And they will tune their instrument to that recipe <coughs> to get the most um, bang for their buck. Now, equal temperament divides the octave into 12 equal half steps, and that this really compromises the pure fifths and the pure thirds. Fretted string instruments are responsible for much of the early interest in equal temperament because the frets pass under all the strings, and this required that the half steps were should be as equal as possible. During the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, it became very standard to use equal temperament and most modern instruments use equal temperament. Um, but people who are interested in historically accurate performances and historically accurate instruments use a, diff a variety of tuning systems. So that's very interesting and that can that's a rabbit hole that's a lot of fun to go down. Um, you really want to develop a quick ability to read intervals. This will enhance your sight reading ability Reading music by naming the notes is a very slow way of reading music. If you can learn to see the intervals and see patterns, you will be a much faster and more accurate sight reader. So if you have learned to read music on your instrument by reading the note names, go back and find some very simple pieces and talk yourself through the intervals and then play those pieces mentally thinking of what the intervals are, not the note names, and develop an ability to read in patterns. So for so, as a kind of a summary here, thirds are line, line, space, space, as are fifths and sevenths. Seconds and fourths and sixths and octaves are line, space, or space, line. If the accidentals are the same, this is a quick way to determine. If the accidentals are the same, except for if you're using F or B, because that's where the half steps are, are between the white keys, then they're going to be uh, perfect. Um, seconds are major and sevenths are minor if the accidentals are the same, except for E to F and B to C. They like to put stuff like this in the book. You may find it helpful and you may not find it helpful. If you don't find it helpful, don't think about it too much, but if you do, go ahead. Um, thirds built on because this is like a lot to remember. I think they just get a kick out of noticing these things. Thirds built on C, F, and G are major if the accidentals are the same, but other thirds are minor if the accidentals are the same. Sixth, whose upper tones are C, F, or G are minor if the accidentals are the same. Um, six, whose upper tones are any of the remaining notes are major if the accidentals are the same. I don't remember this stuff. I think they're just pointing it out to you. Um, so this right here, if you took away the sharp and the flat, you'd have a minor sixth. 
If you added the sharp back in on the C, you'd have a major sixth, and then spreading it further by having a flat is making it an augmented sixth. Read that, think about it, um, come to class with your questions. The two pitches of an interval will occur either one note after the other or simultaneously at the same time. If it's one note after the other, it is called a melodic interval. These are all melodic intervals. If I do this, those are harmonic intervals. And here they just show you the difference. What it looks like to be harmonic and what it looks like to be melodic. Transposing is where you take a piece of music and write it on a higher or lower pitch. And um, sometimes you can do this just by using the intervals. So uh, here's a little paragraph about why it's a good idea to be able to be uh, proficient at transposing. Um, and then transposing by interval. Transposing by clef. If you were, um, I've heard though that if you can write it out, you know, um, unless you're a, an accompanist involved in a type of accompanying that requires transposing, transposing at sight on a regular basis, if you are able to write out a transposition, you are doing well. Um, Clef transposition would be where you'd keep the notes with the same, but you'd just put a different clef on it, which would make the notes higher or lower. Um, you want to be able to transpose the key signature and have everything, you know, be relatively the same. And then if it doesn't have a key signature, you just have to make sure the intervals are correct. So, next we will go into the homework.